Well, we're going to talk. Uh, Steve has suggested that uh, the congressman suggests that we go both ways tonight. That he uh, interviewed me. <laughs> don't don't quote him on that, please. <laughs> that he interviewed me after I've interviewed him. So the, the sort of the, the plan is for 20 minutes of me going at him, and then he's going to come back at me, and then you're all going to get involved with your questions. So it should be pretty exciting. Uh, of course, it's a sad time for us. And I was so impressed that this city has responded, the great city of America responding to the great city of Europe. And the fact that you have the tricolors down at Washington Square on the arch right now, it's just a great thing that somebody thinks of these things. And, and the Empire State Building is dark tonight. And um, what's your reaction to this? I saw your tweet the other night, and I was so taken with a couple of your tweets because, well, you're tweeting, and that's interesting. <laughs> uh, tweets are interesting now. Prayers for Paris tonight. America stands united to rid the world of such hate. Goodwill always overcomes evil. Very optimistic. Then today, remember when the House GOP banned the word French from fries in the House <laughs> dining room? Can we not do silly things like that again? So you capture both personality sides of you, yeah. the, uh, the solemn, respectful, and the wise ass. <laughs> and I, I like both. So talk about your reaction in its, in its composite, uh, what you think this meant to us and what's coming. Sure. Well, Chris, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks to the 92nd Street Y, to Tom Kaplan. I, I, I actually would like to acknowledge Chris Matthews' family is here uh, with us tonight, Kathleen Matthews, uh, who's a dear friend running for Congress in Maryland. She's, uh, she's wonderful. And how about a big hand for the whole Matthews family that's with us? Well, um, look, let's, let's begin with, uh, with some seriousness because these are serious times. And uh, to, to respond to Chris's question, this is a real luxury because when you do Chris Matthews' show, uh, you're, the press people around you say, never speak, never answer a question in more than 30 seconds because that's all the time you get. Today I get to take a little more than 30 seconds to, to respond to his question. Uh, I have never pretended, Chris, to be the smartest member of the United States Congress, although if you listen to m some of my colleagues, you know the competition ain't that stiff. Um, but I know my history, and uh, in particular, I know military history. I'm a student of military history. And look, history presents to, to us these moments, these transformational, in fact, radical changes in the nature of war, in how war is fought, in the tools of war, technology, strategy, tactics, doctrine. And I think we're at one of those moments where we have new rules of war, new forms of warfare. Uh, it's, it may be ironic that exactly 100 years ago, 1915, all the rules of war changed when the central powers used chemical weapons. That had never been done before, chemical weapons. And it was an act of terror. It terrified the planet. And all the rules of war changed. And 70 years ago, the United States changed the nature of warfare by dropping a nuclear weapon. That actually created this doctrine of mutual assured destruction where the nuclear powers decided they weren't going to blow each other up. But on the flip side, the bad side, uh, it created decades of proxy warfare, which gave us Vietnam. And so if you look at history, there are these moments, these pivots, these radical changes where everything changes. We are there now, folks. I believe we're in a world war right now where rules are going to change, technology is going to change, doctrine is going to change. So what does that mean? We had NATO. The United States rewrote the rules uh, with NATO. We need a new NATO that's not built to protect Europe from an attack by the Warsaw Pact, but that is built as an agile uh, and a deployable uh, infrastructure to protect us from the kinds of scenes that we saw in Paris. I'm a member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense. We answer the two most important questions in Washington, D.C., how and much we fund the Department of Defense. My colleagues continue to talk about funding these legacy systems that we don't need anymore. We need different kinds of, of technologies and platforms to fight people who aren't playing by the rules that we're used to. We're going to need to enhance our intelligence capabilities. Every, you know, the convenient answer is we need more boots on the ground in Syria and Iraq. Some people advocate for that. OK, boots on the ground, I get it. But we also need brains on the ground, people who have capacity to understand intelligence developments. So you put all those things together, and I do believe that we're going to need to do things differently and that we are at one of those pivotal moments. Now, here's the good news. 
We've always done these things. The United States has always led the world in creating new rules. Uh, and we're just going to have to do that again. I'm optimistic, ultimately, that will prevail. But it's going to require some tough decisions and different kinds of investments between now and then. We have a, a very difficult challenge facing us, it seems to me. Uh, when we bomb them, or the French bomb them, there's damage, there's people killed, recruitment goes up mm -hmm. because the West is killing Islam. We're, we're strangling Islam. When they make a hit on uh, Russia and they knock down a plane, they kill all those people, hundreds of people, they do what they did in Paris, that's a win for them. So when they kill us, they win. When we kill them, they win. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you fight your way out of that paper bag? Yeah, exactly the problem, and here's what we need to do. Uh, we need to shift the battle from the battlefield to madrasas and to classrooms, because that's where this begins, and we haven't done that effectively. I, for one, believe that no penny of USAID money should go to any government in the world that doesn't make a commitment to stop the teaching and preaching of hatred in its classrooms and in its madrasas. We have to stop teaching kids how to use their hands to blow things up and start teaching kids to use their hands to put things together. And so you're absolutely right. This becomes, look, in, in the history of warfare, we know one thing. Scores get settled. Enemies adapt. At the beginning of warfare, there was somebody who had a, a, a spear and somebody who had a shield. Spear got more precise. Shield got bigger. That's the nature of warfare. We're not, I do not believe, ultimately, that we're going to eliminate terror on the battlefield. We can kill as many people as we want, and I, do, I believe we should try and kill as many people who threaten us. But there's got to be a more effective use of soft power in convincing institutions that are teaching children to teach them how to build economies and not how to blow up innocent civilians in nightclubs. Do you think we can grasp the, the hatred that leads people to blow themselves up? Why? It could be somebody in Newark, somebody in Michigan living here, maybe one generation. They can't get a job. They're just they're misfits, you could argue. We could argue it. But from their point of view, they're not misfits. There's something wrong with the world around them. And uh, they sign up. They become a sleeper cell, like you talked to in a humorous way in your, uh, your book. And how do you deal with that internally, uh, this internal decision to become a suicide killer? And it's, it, it, we see these people in Paris the other day. One may have infiltrated through the refugee line, snuck in the crowd, but the others are Algerian descent. We can tell by the names, and of course the media is very careful about saying somebody's an Arab, but you can tell by the names where they come from originally. And you go, oh, wait a minute, they've been there for maybe one or two generations, but they're not happy. They never assimilated. They're not French culturally, they're willing to kill themselves, to put on those, these bomb vests, knowing they're going to blow themselves to smithereens Friday night coming, because they hate the world around them so much. How do you overcome that? It's hard to overcome. Bernard Lewis deals with this in a very important book, profoundly important book that I read years ago called What Went Wrong. And uh, I don't agree with everything Bernard Lewis suggests, but uh, I thought he was uh, absolutely on point on this issue. There are two ways that civilization deals with failure. Uh, and every civilization experiences failure in one form or another. Uh, one way is to say what went wrong and how do we fix it. That's generally what Americans have done. What went wrong? How do we fix this? The other way is to say what went wrong and who do we blame. I think one of the fundamental problems in the Arab world is you have regimes uh, who have amassed great wealth and great privilege and great power they cannot afford for their citizens to say what went wrong and how do we fix it because the answer is, well, the regimes need to do things like empower women. The regimes need to do things like build infrastructure for a population. The regimes need to do things like educate the population and provide financial services and opportunity. Well, the regimes won't do those things because it's against their interest. And so those reg regimes necessarily have to say, well, if things are going wrong, if you don't have a job and you have no hope, and you have nothing but despair, it's the fault of the Americans, and it's the fault of the Jews. And you go and attack them when you have no hope. Until those regimes become introspective, and until those regimes reform themselves and offer those vital uh, notions of hope and progress to their population, you're going to have this, this, uh, this radicalization, and, and young people will fall prey to that kind of recruiting. Let me ask you about the problem we face in this country. According to the reports today, uh, one of those terrorists involved Friday night was known to be a terrorist. Mm -hmm. They didn't keep, obviously, a close enough watch on him. 
before we get to the comedy in your book, let's get to the reality of the book, which is dealing with surveillance in this country, NSA surveillance. Everybody in their 20s is very jealous of anyone getting into their phone. I don't care myself. Yeah. But if you don't own a car and you don't own a house and all you really own is that phone, that's your world. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want anybody getting into that phone. Now, I don't care if somebody's listening to me because I'm pretty boring, but um, <laughs> uh, this is a big issue of surveillance. And young people, millennials, are very angry about any notion that the government's listening to them. I don't care. How do we track down people in this country who we know, we may be third, Russians, French, either us or the UK next, who knows, but we know it's coming, this pattern. How do we catch the bad guys before they act and yet maintain a free society? Well, we have been having this debate since the Alien and Sedition Act uh, of the 18th century. This has been the one constant debate that the American people have had with themselves. How do you stop the bad guys before the bad guys do bad things? And the pendulum has always swung. That's what I tried to deal with in, in the book. But if I did a serious uh, policy analysis of the balance between civil rights and national security, it would have been a bestseller maybe in my mother's house. But, but nowhere else. But the fact is, we've, we've been doing these debates. We've been having these debates. The pendulum, I believe, swung too far after 9-11. It swung too far. Uh, today, today, I would imagine, if you did a poll of the American people, are you willing to surrender some of your civil rights and civil liberties to stop the kind of attack in Paris from happening here? The majority of Americans would probably say, yes, I'm willing. I want to be safe. If you ask that question when you don't see the grisly images that we're seeing on, on the news, a majority of the American people would say, no, it's none of the government's business. This has been a, 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 a swinging thematic for most of our history. And generally, the pendulum squares in the middle at a certain point. That's what I tried to deal with in this. Well, let's talk about the book. You, it's a, first of all, I want to talk about... And comedy. then I'm going to ask you some questions. Well, I know, because you've used up your time rather quickly. <laughs> uh, first of all, the humor in the book is as good as Bilko. Now, my argument about comedy is it has not been as funny since Phil Silver's. And the only thing close to it, of course, is Larry David and Curb Your Enthusiasm. My daughter and our family, we binge on that in our summer house because it's really funny. It's not Bill Cosby kind of cute. It's really funny. Your humor is really outrageously funny. Thank okay, you. And I don't know how you got to it, but let's talk about one of your characters. It's a, a, a wife, a, a woman who has a lot of time on her hands for some reason, and she's decided that she's going to be a one-person summit meeting with the Arab world, and she's Jewish, and she's going to, they have a condo down in Florida, and she decides to let this guy, who's in charge of renting the, t giving out the towels at the condo at the swimming pool every morning. Now, this guy is secretly a cell member. He's planning Armageddon against the United States, but she decides that he's a swell young guy, and she's going to help him out by letting her use their condo. Then she falls under the surveillance of the NSA, because what's going on here? This suspected cell member now has a place to operate from. It's hilarious because of the absurdity of the whole thing, but you can recognize the characters. By the way, her job is to make sure, not, his job, the cell member who's an Arab terrorist, his job is to make sure that the Jewish customers of the condo don't get more than two towels. <laughs> so every day the people come and ask for three towels, maybe four towels, he's got to say no to them, meanwhile planning their demise. It's, it's, well, it's a hoot. First of all, you get to the issue of surveillance in this weird, funny way. Talk about how your mind as a U.S. congressman with all the responsibilities of thinking about the constituents and 700,000 people and keeping them happy, how did you find the time and the brain time to do this? Well, I wrote the brain book. Brain time. I wrote the book during most um, congressional meetings because, or hearings. <laughs> I mean, why would you want to pay attention to that? Uh, you know, I, uh, I grew up on Long Island. I had three dreams. Uh, one was to, to be a congressman. Uh, two, uh, I wanted to be an author. And three, I wanted to play center field for the Mets. Um, but since I sucked at baseball, I had to focus on, on one and two. And, and here's, here's where I began uh, playing with the book. Uh, just after 9-11, having served as a member of the Huntington Town Council, where my most important meeting was with the highway superintendent to go over his snow budget, uh, I'm suddenly in these classified briefings with the President of the United States, George Bush, and the Secretary of Defense, and the Secretary of State, and the CIA director, sitting in the White House listening to them talk about whether we should invade Iraq. And the things I heard were just an extraordinary dialogue for a satire. I couldn't believe <laughs> what I was hearing. And you don't have to take my word for it. Read John Meekham's uh, new biography of uh, the first Bush, where he calls Dick Cheney iron ass uh, and, and Rumsfeld arrogant. Well, 
Uh, I kind of saw that when I was sitting at these meetings. So I had this great dialogue, but I didn't have a story. I had no plot. I just had the dialogue. I'd come out of these meetings, weren't allowed, I couldn't bring my, my iPhone or Blackberry in because they were classified and I didn't write anything down that I shouldn't, but I would just kind of capture that dialogue. And then one day I was sitting at a meeting of the House Armed Services Committee where some four-star general had come in to apologize because it was revealed that the United States government as, a, as part of its top secret surveillance program thought that a group of terrorists were going to attack our soil and it turned out that those terrorists weren't terrorists, it was a group of elderly Quakers. <laughs> and the tools of their terror were they're gonna to run to the home, the uh, office max and buy some Sharpies and some oak tag and have a peaceful protest. And yet we spied, we spied on a group of elderly Quakers and that's when I had my story. The problem is I knew nothing about elderly Quakers, <laughs> but I do know something about 57 year old white Jewish men from Long Island. And I created this character, Morris Feldstein, who, you know, he just doesn't want to make waves, he doesn't want to get involved, he watches the Mets and Turner classic movies only in black and white. Uh, I love that. Only in black and white. He can't wait to get home and getting his with, barga lounge. So Rona, Rona, Rona Feldstein can't wait to watch Chris Matthews on Hardball. No, it's, it's the old movies. And, and uh, Morris is like, the only Hardball I want to see is the Mets. And poor Morris gets fingered by Dick Cheney as a major terrorist. And the entire United States government puts him under surveillance and ruins his life. Mm. Uh, and I wrote the book uh, every chance I could. Well, when, when do I get to ask you some I questions? I get a minute. It's a minute. Okay. Oh, see? This is what I, I, I have to tell you, I have been, I, I, I get nervous when I have remember to go Sam on hardball and he asks questions. Remember a question. Sam Levinson, how great he was? Sam Levinson was this, came from a family of like 11 kids. They all became PhDs and doctors <laughs> and everything. He had the funniest line he said about the, student, the, the piano kid who was taking piano lessons. And the teacher said, if you don't practice, I'll tell your parents you're talented. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I should say about you. You are talented. Oh, thank you. And I thank forget you. all this thank you. theory about what he did. It's the Thanks. writing ability, which is fascinating. Uh, last thought. I want to ask you. Wrote, you, vote, you, vote, you voted against the, uh, the Iranian deal. I, want mm -hmm. to, I know that's a hot issue in this community, especially, but everywhere it's a hot issue. I want yeah. to ask you about two things, not related sure. to that, because that's a mm -hmm. decision you made. And I, thought, I love the way that you and Sandy Levin have been trying to mm -hmm. seal that thing off and move forward since it's a fact now. Um, what's Bibi Netanyahu's role in history? Hmm. And what do you want your role to be? And then we'll get the serious questions to me. Wow. But you got to get over these two hurdles. Bibi Netanyahu's role in history, Jewish hurdle. history, Israeli history, world history. What, what role is he playing? I mean, uh, I was thinking of Shamir. They used to say he's a wall, and a wall has certain yeah. things he can do, but talking and listening are not one of them. Uh, Shamir was really t Is he different than Shamir? Is he less, more... Fluid, more, more interesting? What is the story on BB? Well, it's fascinating that you should ask, and I'm going to answer it with, uh, by bringing you behind the scenes. I visit with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu whenever I'm in Israel. It's a great privilege. And in my last meeting, we were on a CODEL, congressional delegation, with uh, Nancy Pelosi. And the meeting ended. We're in the uh, you know, ceremonial room where members of Congress met with him. And the meeting ended, and he said, OK, I want everybody to come into my office. Come with me. And he brought us into his office. And he showed us uh, a, an antiquity that he has on display in his office. And he was telling us the history of this antiquity. And what struck me as he was explaining this to us was that he views himself as a profoundly important part of Israel's history, that he is shaping Israel's history, that he is part of that lineage, that historic lineage where this ant ant antiquity began. So I believe is that. It a, is, it a, is it a role of transformation or is it a role of holding the line? Uh, I believe that it's more holding the line. I believe that he views himself as the last line uh, of defense uh, against uh, great uh, and grave danger uh, and peril. And I believe that history is going to treat him the way that history generally treats world leaders. And that is that the, the blemishes, for whatever blemish, blemishes exist, the blemishes generally are erased by history. Uh, and um, history will be generally kind to him and will treat him as a truly historic figure uh, on, on the world stage. As to uh, how I want to be remembered? Well, how do you want to be now? How do I want What's to be? What's your mission? What is my mission? Yeah. Well, just to be the best congressman I can be. And, uh, uh, Come on, you got well, a bigger I, goal than that. I, uh, You're smart. <laughs> or smart, as my constituents would say. Uh, uh, 
I, uh, I have uh, served in Congress. Uh, look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I never thought I'd make it past my first term. Uh, I was elected uh, in a very Republican district on Long Island, uh, represented by my predecessor, Rick Lazio. Oh my God, the guy with the papers. Rick Lazio, who the walked across the stage. The one who presented the papers to Hillary. Yeah. And Rick Lazio was a Republican winning by 75, 80% of the vote, and then I won with 48% of the vote. I was the lowest performing Democrat of anybody when I was elected in 2000. So for my first term in Congress, because of my superstition, I refused to buy a dresser, furniture. I, I had three wall bounce bags for my clothing. <laughs> because I didn't want to curse anything. So I never thought that, uh, that I'd uh, have the longevity and the seniority that, that, uh, uh, that I've amassed. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure you know, what, uh, whether it'll be two, four, six, eight, ten years. Um, when are you going to get the house back? I think it's going to be very hard to get it back uh, immediately. I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. Um, in 2012, House Democrats got 1.4 million more votes than House Republicans. And House Republicans still retain the majority. Why is that? Because they built a firewall in redistricting. And with the Democratic Party, I know that there are Republicans and Democrats here and people in, the, in, in between, so I don't uh, approach this from a partisan perspective, but from a strategic perspective. What Democrats need to do to get back the majority is make an investment in winning state houses back. Because if you can start winning state legislatures back between now and 2020, we will then have control of the maps, we will have control in redistricting, we will rebuild that. And you know how I know this? Because it's exactly what the Republicans did. It's exactly what they had done. They made a decision not to double down on expanding their majority in the House in 2004, 2006, but to make sure that they had control of the maps in state houses in 2010, 2012, which ex explains why it's so difficult for us to pick up the majority. Yeah. Can it happen? I'll make a prediction right now. If Donald Trump or Ted Cruz is the Republican nominee, I think we can take the House back. <laughs> On that note, I yield, uh, I yield the All travel right. to you. So I, I, Congressman. I started to say this is just such a wonderful moment for me because when a press secretary says to a member of Congress, you're going on hardball tonight. It just strikes fear and anxiety into every, every fiber in my being. It's one of, the toughest, uh, one of the toughest interviews. So now I get to uh, ask Chris Matthews some questions, and then we're going to uh, open it up. So I want to begin. Chris has done two extraordinary books. Uh, one is, uh, and Tom Kaplan referred to them, one is uh, uh, Jack Kennedy, Elusive Hero, and the other, Tip and the Gipper. I want to talk about Kennedy the role of the press, and the difference in how the press may have treated Kennedy versus how the press operates now. So, for example, if there had been a kind of Clinton-esque scandal uh, in the Kennedy administration, and there may have been, <laughs> would, we, would we be see hearing about it? Would it have been reported as, uh, as it was in the Clinton administration? Well, it's tricky because, uh, first of all, Kennedy was more discreet. <laughs> and uh, no, they really were. There's all this, you read these great stories about the tunnels underneath the Carlisle Hotel and these crazy things he did. Uh, meeting, he would do things like uh, meet, meet somebody on room, what room number? Just tell me the room number. Right. And he would have arranged up a bottle of whiskey waiting to pretend it was a social occasion. Uh, and he would arrive and that would be it. And nobody else would know about it. Uh, he had, I think, one true romance, uh, that would be Mary Meyer, who uh, I think he really, really cared for. And I, and I say that just to put a little romance in this, because you wanted to get into the other part, but he actually did like her a lot, because when he got the word that ZM had been killed, mm -hmm. and that whole coup thing had broken bad, and he was responsible for it morally, and he knew it. Uh, that's who he spent the afternoon with, with, with even after the relationship was, was non-physical, I think. So he had real romance. He also had people like Mimi Fonstock who would travel on the plane with him. She was 19. The press didn't know about that. I mean, people like Hugh Sidey would say afterwards from Time Magazine. I went down to visit him, and there he was with uh, Chuck Spaulding, one of his buddies he always went with. He liked to double date. <laughs> I tell you. And he had people like Ben Bradley and Charlie Bartlett who were married guys who were complete prudes, pretty much. Not Ben, completely, obviously. But... Uh, they were married guys, settled down, and he, would, he and Jackie would be fellow couples with them. Mm -hmm. And they had that life 
style. And then he had other guys like Torby McDonald and, uh, and George Smathers and Chuck Spalding he would go after the women with. He'd go girling with. And he always liked to have a buddy along. You could figure that one out if you want, psychologically. But he needed to have a guy company, it seemed. Uh, could he have gotten away with it today? Well, no, because today you have all this smattering of, you have uh, social media that might spot him with somebody. Uh, there's no loyalty at all to the establishment anymore. Uh, but you know, the question really comes down to this. When Linda Tripp went to Drudge, or when Linda Tripp went to Newsweek, and Evan Thomas and the rest of them sat on the Monica story for a long time, or they sat on the story with, the, with uh, Judy uh, Exner, Judy Campbell all those years, Hayes Gorey, Time Magazine sat on that story. They all sat on this. They knew about it. They just didn't think it was something to run. There were stories that, you know, I, I don't want to get into, but more recently, one of the networks knew something, and they just said, this is too big a story to run. And I think there's, there's tremendous hesitancy to get into people's private life. I've always argued that if Clinton was involved with a movie star in a hotel room somewhere, it wouldn't have been a story because who would have broken the story? But when Jennifer Flowers holds a press conference in New York, you know, in Midtown, even then the New York Times and most of the papers buried it way back in the paper. Uh, the, the, the reporters don't enterprise these stories even today. Maybe some of the young reporters, they certainly don't have the restraint the older reporters had, but um, it's tricky. I mean, I think you can have a relationship today with somebody outside your marriage and it will never be reported. I mean, discretion still works. And I think that people understand that. And they, there was a guy, a senator for years, lived with his top aide for years and everybody knew it. Johnson with uh, Helen Douglas. His car was parked out in front of her house all the time. I mean, yeah, this was almost like the French, you know? <laughs> and, and, and nobody reported it. But I'll just say this, I think the young kids today in press in the journalism world are a little less squeamish about blowing a story like that. I think most people would say, this is below my dignity, I don't do this stuff, uh, because uh, it doesn't matter to anybody except the people involved, and it's not a public story. But the answer is, um, Bill Clinton must have asked himself that question one million mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. How come Jack could do it and I can't do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I'm, just, I'm sure he said, how, come, how unfair this is. The answer is, the, the, the Jack Kenny went out with classy women. <laughs> do you feel pressure? They didn't have friends they had to talk to. When I'll a story, this when a sto you, yeah, you will. When it, when a story is breaking in social media, when something's going viral, do you feel pressure to, to report it? Yeah, but we pick our stories. My show is politics, and uh, I always say to, we have a meeting in the morning. I know you want to know how we do this. Yeah. It's just like the old Dick Van Dyke show. With Rosemary and Maury Amsterdam. Maury Amsterdam. It is yeah. just like that. We have about five or six people. I've got one of my producers who is Madame Defarge. She's so far left. <laughs> she is so far left. Mm -hmm. Then I've got a, a couple of people. We have a couple of gay producers. We have a couple of women. Different. It's a, it's a mix of people. And, and, and they all have their different favorites. And they have their different points of view. Some are a little more politically neutral. But they all have a point of view. And we're a political show with a point of view. And, uh, we have these great arguments. I have one producer who's so pro-Hillary, another guy is so pro-Hillary, and every time anybody takes a shot in the conversation or we pick up some news about it, they say, but what about this? The other guy's just as bad. So we're having that kind of argument. I think I'm a different person in that room than I am on the air. I think I'll argue a point of view that may be more conservative, that just because I feel like my gut's conservative on a lot of things, I'll argue, and then I'll get on the air and I'll sound more liberal, because I've been through this argument. You know, you probably do it with your uh, legislative people. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a fight. And, but the big thing we try to do every night, and Agronsky taught me this, Martin Agronsky, who really started this roundtable thing years ago with the Gronsky and company. He said, our job is to sharpen the issue. So at the end of the half hour, you know what the fight's about. And that's why a lot of African guys that come here, you meet them as doormen, and you meet them as uh, guys driving cars and people from the Middle East. They love our kind of television, the freedom in this country, where you can hear the American argument on television. It is so great. You arrive in this country, you have English, you immediately know what we're fighting about. It is so great, this country is so, Israel's like that too, but so democratic and so loud. You know, as Tom said, it's loud. And you can learn the argument. And these guys come up to me with strong accents and they know exactly what I do for a living. They know where I stand. And the country, I, I think, benefits from it. Uh, it shouldn't be your only source of news though. The argument shows. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always say to people, put your own soup together, your stew. Put in the Times, if you can get it. The Journal, just to sort of bounce things out. 
And in fact, the news sections of the journal are very good. And the op-ed op page of the journal is really good for knowing what the argument from the right is. You know, there's some really smart people. I read Peggy Noonan almost religiously every Saturday. I love the review section on Saturday of the Wall Street Journal. I think it's the best thing around. I also uh, read Politico. I read the Washington Post because it's really easy to read. Uh, <laughs> You know, Walter Shapiro, a writer once told me that you can't start with the times. It's just too hard. You gotta have something like the New York Post to sort of rev up the engine. And then, and then, you, can, and then you can read the times. You know, it's just, you're, you, the first cup of coffee and you go, oh, these sentences are so long. And then you go, but you pick up the Post and it's a boom, you know. And then the Washington Post is sort of broadsheet, middle level there. And I always go right to style to see what the gossip is. I go to see how the Phillies are doing, excuse me. They're oh, not doing well, oh. they're not doing well. Uh, and, and, and check out the social stuff that sports. But then I read all the op-ed page people. I love Gene Robinson, he's on the show all the time. Uh, yeah. I, I, the, I treasure the opinion of guys like Howard Feynman and David, and David Korn, who's a lefty, but really a journalist, and, uh, and Joe Walsh. I have the people on the show I want to listen to, and, I, and it's great, because all I have to do is get on and have it just come at me. And, and I go, good, next, 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 and, and challenge them and fight with them. And, and I, politicians have a tougher on my show because I'm tougher on politicians, because I, I think I know what you're up to. Toughest politician you've uh, interviewed, present company accepted. Zell Miller, when he wanted to have a, 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 when he wanted to have a duel with me. <laughs> I, I mean, that guy, I was Talk down, about that. I was down on uh, 34th and Broadway, Miracle on 34th Street, I call it, and I'm right next to the, the, the big store there. And uh, Macy's end up, uh, and he comes on there, and he's loaded for bear. Somebody told him to get mad at me, and he's mad about Michelle Malkin or some interview I did, and he said, you're not going to do to me what you did to that little girl. I go, yeah, right. And he comes at me like, just unbelievable. And I said, uh, Senator, what do you mean the Democrats only want to spend money on spitballs? That's their only, their only military uh, system they believe in. What do you mean by spitballs? And he says, well, that's a metaphor. A metaphor. A, a metaphor. And I said, well, what, a metaphor for what? And I said, because that was the time that a Democratic Southerner went on the Republican convention here in New York and blasted his party, which I don't like. I don't like that stuff. And so uh, it was great. And I, it was so scary. Of course, Rick Cap and my, the head of the network at the time said, my ear, savor it. Keep him on. Keep him on. Mm -hmm. And it's just like in the movies when they say, we got a guy and he's in, they're about to catch the caller. You know, <laughs> you know, the guy's blackmailing somebody or he's got the hostage. Keep him on. We got, oh, we lost him. You know, they, always, they said, we just lost him. But they never get him. They, oh, we got him. He's at 24th and 8th. No, we got and uh, so it was less like, the, he kept savor it. Says, keep him on. Keep him on. So then I had to do this terrible thing of saying, we'd really like you to come on tomorrow night in person instead of remote from the convention. Could you come on tomorrow night? That'd be great. Just teasing him and teasing right. him. And it was awful. The guy's a war hero, a military guy. I wrote him a note. We had a nice exchange of notes a while back. And, but, you know, that was great television. Jesus. Yeah. And then the other night, that night, uh, somebody was demonstrating against uh, uh, Abu Ghraib. And they had a big black cone hat on, the black thing. And it jumps me right out there in the corner there, 34th at Herald Square. And jumps me, Howard Feynman, who's my friend, is there. And he actually does, as in a movie, like, like in a three stage, a double take. <laughs> <laughs> he actually did, we have the tape of it, he actually does a double take. What just happened? The guy, I had a bodyguard then, a big guy named Chris Peaches from Boston, big heavy guy. He tackles him. This is great stuff. You know, this is TV, all on live television. So you asked me my favorite interview, that was it. That's a good one. That's that a good, was a good one. But all I right. mean, I've had fights with people. Like Michelle Malkin, I think, not Michelle Malkin, Michelle Bachman, I think we made her one night when she came on and said she wanted a, a, a federal investigation of the anti-Americanism of the Democratic members of the Congress. And, oh, great. <laughs> keep that up. Keep that up, Congressman. Yeah, right. You know, and so that was pretty wild. But you always want to, you always want to hear somebody say something that, that isn't on the list of things to say, that their people didn't tell them to say, and it reveals something about them or the debate, and it exposes them. So that's what you're looking for with a good guest. Some, no no sound bites, expose just... Expose something, I always say, tell me something I don't know. Mm -hmm. And to get them to, uh, I love doing it. I, I love it. Mm -hmm. And uh, nothing drives me crazy than when somebody comes on who's been prepped by their staff and, and does robo-talking. Who's the one... Uh, living figure in the world that you desperately want to interview that you haven't had been able to interview? Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't planned in advance, by the way, I want you to know. <laughs> it works for everybody and it works for me. Every guy in the world wants to meet Jennifer Aniston. I don't know what it is. Really? Every guy likes her. Don't you? 
I don't know what her position is on the issues. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just, we all like Jennifer Aniston. And, 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 I mean, what seriously, I'd like, in? I don't know. I, I think, uh, I'm, like you, I think we're all Churchill nuts. I mean, mm -hmm. we love the guy, and he was unbelievable. And I, I would love to, I mean, I've got three or four people I read everything about. I'll read anything about Roosevelt, anything about Churchill, anything about John Kennedy, anything about Hemingway. I just find those three or four people, maybe throw in Fitzgerald, who just fascinate me. Yeah. Um, every single thing, I see their name, I want to read it. Have you been to the Hemingway house in Cuba? No, I, I'll, when, he's, uh, when he's going, I'll get down. Yeah. I'm not going yeah. down. You're not going down there. Why? Why? Not, why? why I think Fidel, I, I'm still anti-communist. Mm -hmm. I haven't changed. I think that Fidel made his decision in the Cold War when it's at its worst for us in the late 50s when it looked like we were losing mm -hmm. and things were changing. After Sputnik and Cuba and the map of the world started to become a little too pink and things started to develop that looked like maybe the Russians had the economic engine to beat us with systems analysis. They could beat capitalism. And I thought... He bet his bet, and he would have been standing there with his goddamn fatigues mm -hmm. on when we had the firing squads in Central Park. He would have been standing there. Mm -hmm. I know what side he was on. And so it's not about free thinking or liberal thinking or left-wing thinking. He made a geopolitical decision to go with our enemies. I just think, and I believe that. So I'm guessing if his communications director called you and... I refused and, to meet and, with that government. They say, we'll get you down. We just want you to meet with some of the government people down. Right. I said, I'm not going to meet with them. I don't want to talk to them. You actually would say, I'm sorry, Jennifer Aniston's coming on. <laughs> okay. no, uh, how about a big hand for Chris like, Matthews? Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll open it up. You have questions? Or? Okay. So you don't want to do, let me do these. Okay. Split we'll split it up. All right. You want to go first, Chris? Well, this is a good one because it's your, your uh, wheelhouse. If Hillary Clinton is elected president, what will she do to break the gridlock in Congress oh, with the Tea Party Republicans? We haven't talked about Hillary yet. Yeah. Well, look, the Congress of the United States uh, is now being controlled by 30 or 40 members of this Freedom Caucus. Uh, I, I call them the exotics. <laughs> they, they are exotic uh, in their thinking. And it it's just astounds me that John Boehner, as you well know, arguably the most conservative speaker of the House of Representatives in history and wasn't conservative enough for this, this group of uh, exotics. Uh, we, we now have Paul Ryan. I, I believe that the honeymoon is going to be short uh, and the marriage is going to be annulled very quickly uh, with, uh, with Paul Ryan. Uh, the, and, and here's why. Well, how's Hillary so deal with this thing? So let's, well, first we have to, let's... let's Go back to hardball. Let's, let's, uh, there, okay. Let's... <laughs> The, the, the problem is this. Why is the, why is the Congress so polarized? It's very simple, folks. It's what we talked about before. It's redistricting. So of the 435 congressional districts in America, how many districts do you believe are really in the middle, really competitive? Shout it out. How many of 435 congressional districts are truly competitive? 25, 40, that's about it. That's about it. Every other congressional district has been drawn to the far left or drawn to the far right to protect incumbents, <laughs> which means that most incumbents are either protecting their left flank or protecting their right flank, which explains the polarization. One of the things that we should do, that we will not do, to level the playing field is to have national nonpartisan redistricting so that dist districts are drawn not to protect incumbents, but to have competitive uh, elections. How will Hillary deal with it? I actually think that she has um, uh, more capability uh, of getting some reasonable Republicans to the table. Uh, than, uh, than others in the Democratic uh, field. Uh, she better than now. Barack Obama, do you think, in personal relations? There are personal, first of all, she can win in many competitive districts. Uh, and some Republicans realize that. Uh, and they're, they're going to want to, they won't spurn the relationship. If Barack Obama calls some of these Republicans, they won't take the call. They won't take the call because he's viewed as the enemy. But if Hillary Clinton were to call some of these Republicans, they would deal. They'd go up to the White House. She has the capacity to be uh, the gipper in tipping the gipper. So in districts uh, like yours around the suburbs together. of Philly, we've got people like me in there and Fitzpatrick and mm -hmm. Dent. Those districts would be afraid of her coming yes. in. Yep. That's smart. And around yes. here in New York, too, the same suburban districts would be afraid of her assaulting a member. That's, that's exactly right. That's so smart. Yeah. yeah. So it is doable. Yeah. Will, that, will that get her 218? It is doable. Will that get her 218 and pass bills? Uh, I'm sorry, say it again. Will well, she be able to get majority votes in the House? It depends, on, it depends on the bill. It absolutely yeah. depends on the bill. Um, OK, here's a, here's a you okay. go first, because it's your turn. But I have a really a brutal one here. Right. Oh, no. Well, then I better go first, second, third to, to uh, avoid that. OK, Chris. 
Bring the Washington, being the Washington insider that you are, are you surprised at the downfall of Jeb? Yeah, because we all, I mean, this is all common parlance, and the congressman knows we all basically think alike. There's so many, this common wisdom that Jeb is so much smarter than W. That uh, <laughs> he's more cerebral. Jeb uh, doesn't have, W had great political skills, though. I mean, he is a real, he's almost mm -hmm. in, the, in the league with Bill Clinton, in the league with. He's not, nobody's as good as Bill. Mm -hmm. A bill comes up to anybody, gives you that two minutes of magic, a male or female, which is irresistible. It's that right. the big blue eyes right in your eyes, thinking that you're the only person on the planet that he ever has thought about. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> there is nothing like it. It's spectacular. W is a little more wistful. W will like, I remember this great scene where, two, two, we showed this, where two guys running against each other in 2004. Uh, John Kerry is a friend of ours, but very formal, to mm -hmm. put it lightly, very formal. And uh, he belongs exactly where he is, by the way, Secretary of State. It's a perfect job for him. Uh, for diplomatic niceties. So he goes into a, a, a dinette and he finds a woman. She's obviously just doing her job because she needs the money. She's not in love with it. She's got a paperback book and she's just trying to get a little time away from this terrible job at lunchtime. She's eating a sandwich. Eating a, he stands over her and delivers his five point program for job production. <laughs> and this is horrible. Then we watch W go into a little dinette. He sees a young family, parents in their 30s, t three kids, one's a boy, two, two girls. W comes in the door, instinctively walks in the door and says, hey, dude, what's it like to have two sisters? You know, <laughs> you'd be the only boy. It's, you could call it BS, but it is truly a great way of campaigning because you immediately establish connections. Uh, where was I heading with this? Yeah. Jeb. Jeb. <laughs> Jeb. Jeb wasn't as and, good as and, uh, and that's the problem with Jeb right now. <laughs> 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 Jeb, Jeb, what I've known about Jeb is he's, he's a likable guy. He's kind of like... Hoss Cartwright, he's kind of like big. Uh, he always leans over like this canine thing he does when he asks him a tough question. He turns his head to the side. It is so weird. Watch it. Well, you know, uh, well, what's with the head turn? You got a tall, lower ceiling here? I'm trying to fit into this right wing crazy world, so let me try to fit into it. And he's always making that physical contortion. I, feel, I don't feel sorry for him because he did pick this thing to do, you know. Yeah. But he was, he was very conservative. On, he was against affirmative action down there, fought it all the time. He had ideological principles, which we not, may not share. I don't, but I knew what he stood for. He was big on magnet schools, charters. He had very strong beliefs about education. He doesn't come off with any ideology now, any philosophy that I can understand. I can't discern why he's running. Remember the Teddy Kennedy question from Roger Mudd? Why are you running for president? You have to always ask that question. And if you catch him by surprise, then, then that's really a problem. Like, hadn't you, th right. hadn't you thought you of this not question? Not think about this, right? <laughs> hadn't this not come write up the in your head? You? Right. I always said to people, if you're gonna run for office, wait, have a few drinks, stay up to one in the morning, sit all alone, and decide why you're doing it. And no matter what that reason is, hold on to it. It could be just I'm ambitious. There's nothing wrong with ambition. It's how our society right. works. Just I want to get ahead. I want to do something important. I want to be somebody important. That's great. Just know that. And, and say, I'm going to fight for that because it's worth that to me. But you can't be confused. And he seems confused. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a problem. I think he's doing it because we're in the carpeting business. You know? We do carpeting. We do presidencies. You know? This is, <laughs> this is, this is what we do. I didn't decide, right. you know, my brother, my father, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting into Jewish humor now. Yeah, it's good, it's good, it's good. Right. <laughs> okay, this is for Good's you. Right. All right, sir. No, this is for me, this is too okay. tough. You it's ready? hardball, remember. This is the zinger. Okay, here we go. Why did you vote against the nuclear pact oh, for the Rams? Oh, you know, I'm surprised that even came up. I haven't heard that question before. Uh, I voted for it. Against it. Uh, I voted against the, uh, oh, thanks, thanks. Do you want to revise and extend yeah, your remarks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I tried very hard to get to yes. Um, I really wanted to be able to vote yes. Um, at the end of the day, I couldn't bring myself to vote for the deal uh, for reasons that uh, have not really been uh, Reported. I mean, most of the reasons that my colleagues voted against it, you know, have been reported and overreported. I had a different take. I do not believe that Iran is going to engage in this flagrant violation of, of the deal. I don't believe they're that stupid. These are some of the smartest and most uh, 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 sophisticated thinkers uh, around. 
I do believe that they're going to engage in a series of small cheats, and nobody likes to apply the death penalty for a misdemeanor. Uh, and so there's going to be a cheat here, and the, Uni and the United States is going to say, well, yeah, it was a small cheat, we'll let him go this time. And then there's going to be another cheat down the line, and a third cheat, and a fourth cheat, and pretty soon you have an aggregate of cheating that uh, constitutes a flagrant violation of the deal. Uh, but no penalties, uh, and uh, it was on that basis and, and several other reasons uh, why uh, that, uh, that led me to vote against it. I will, I will also say this, take you behind the scenes. So, I, you know, I dreamt growing up on Long Island of that one moment when I'd be on the floor of the House of Representatives as a congressman and somebody would hand me a piece of paper that said, the president is on the phone, he must speak with you. That was my dream. And when it happened, I realized what a nightmare that could be. <laughs> what a nightmare Did you take the call? I, of course I took the call. So what happened was, um, let's see, we have a few more minutes. Um, the, the president summoned the entire Democratic caucus to the White House for a special meeting about the deal. And I was told that after the meeting, the president was going to want to pull me aside and have a conversation with me. And uh, I knew then that I wasn't going to support uh, the deal. I couldn't support the deal. And we went up to the meeting, it was in the East Room. And this is a little trick that Speaker Boehner sometimes would, would uh, former Speaker Boehner played on us. When, when there was a big meeting with the President of the Democratic Caucus, in the middle of the meeting, he'd call a vote. Call a vote. And now we're 20 minutes away from the floor at the White House. And so when I heard those pagers go off and the beepers go off, this is the House Democratic cloakroom <laughs> advising all members that there is a vote on the floor. At that moment, John Boehner became my man of the year <laughs> because I realized I wasn't going to have to have this conversation. I went back to uh, the floor. It was the day before the recess, so it was a six-week recess. Got to the floor, was given a piece of paper saying, the President wants to talk to you. Went into the Democratic cloakroom, was on the phone with him for 25 minutes. He said, I'd like you to come up to the White House tomorrow. I foolishly said, well, Mr. President, as you know, tomorrow is the first day of recess, and I have to be back in my district. And he said, yeah, Steve, I kind of have access to planes. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the conversation, he, he fully understood. We went through, I methodically went through my reservations, and, and he understood. Now, where do, we, where, where do we go here? Look, the politics of this, the optics, have actually been, uh, you know, I'm very concerned about the politics and the optics. We need to get beyond that. We now need to work, and this is what I'm trying to do with Sandy Levin, we now need to work on a post-deal environment where we're providing Israel with the assurances, the technologies, the platforms it needs uh, to feel safe in a post-deal environment, uh, and we're accentuating our uh, areas of agreement rather than trying to exploit whatever disagreements if Beyond we Iron Dome, what does Israel have for anti-missile defense? What does Israel have if they ever, you say 20 years from now, 15 years from now even? Yeah. I don't think it'll happen. We don't think it'll happen, but it's always sitting there. How does Israel maintain its mental state of mm -hmm. relative happiness through missile defense. Is it, there a system? Yeah, well, it, it, it does it. it. It maintains its mental state by knowing that the United States of America will always guarantee its QME, its quality. But I'm talking about a first strike edge. situation. And there are, so Israel does have, it's got Iron Dome, it's got uh, the Arrow missile system, it's got David Sling. It does have a multi layered, 360 degree uh, level of protection. Does that point defense or the whole territory? Does that cover everything in Israel or just... Sure? Well, presumably it would cover everything. There still needs to be some development, some te yeah. uh, technology uh, perfections. Uh, I, I don't believe and I never believe that Iran is foolish enough to use a nuclear weapon to strike at Israel. I don't think that's the area of, of instability. I do worry that Iran's nuclear program will create uh, a massive proliferation of nuclear development programs throughout the, the rest of the Middle East. And that, that is a major concern. Yeah, well said, thank you. Okay. Well, here's a question I don't like All to right. answer, but I've answered it so many times. Go ahead, and then I have one for and you. On, on the air, and I hate it, but it's a good one. Yeah. For Chris, what for was Chris. the problem you saw in Al Gore that made you vote for George W. Bush? Many regrets now? Well, that was one time I didn't vote for a Democrat for president, and I knew Gore. And I thought, and I've said this on the air many times uh, about this, I, I didn't know which Gore we were going to get, and I was worried about that. There was the, uh, the hawkish Gore that ran in 88, and I was with him then, actually. Yeah. I hung out with my friend Bob Schiffer with us tonight. We were with him. And then there was the, the, the dovish Gore that showed up after he lost, very dovish. And I, I had a problem with his message of fear. He was running, he should have ran on Clinton's record and pushed Clinton aside on the personal stuff. Instead, he went the other way. He, he stuck with him on the personal stuff when he got in trouble with Monica and pushed him aside on the policy. I thought he was 
I didn't, I didn't think he was of sound uh, purpose. I thought he was trying to scare us into voting for, us, for him. I never, I, the kiss, all that stuff, the whole thing to, uh, struck me as not sound. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get any further because I don't dislike him, obviously, but I, I thought there was something wrong there. And I made a big mistake about W because I'd watched him campaign, and although he wasn't deep, uh, <laughs> I thought there was a regularness to his thinking that was what we needed in foreign policy. When he said, we've got to get rid of, a, we need humility in foreign policy. My God, what happened to that? Then I thought he did very well with 9-11, three days later to, up here in New York on Friday. I don't think anybody could have rallied the country better in this kind of awkward language. We're going to get the people that knocked down these buildings. It's kind of a strange, almost tinker toy way he was talking. And, and I thought, my God, that is what we need, a real simple leader at this point. <laughs> And I thought I was great. I'm trying to justify the vote for him, which was a mistake. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then I began getting word from my friend, uh, uh, you know, Duberstein, Ken Duberstein, mm -hmm. you know him. Yes, yeah, sure. Who's a pal of uh, General Powell. And I started to get these intimations, starting with uh, Camp David right after 9-11, that the, the Neos were pushing for Iraq. It had nothing to do with 9-11. Mm -hmm. They'd been waiting for this boy, and they saw this as their cue, and they started pushing for it. And I got the first good news was that, Cohen, that he had told uh, Wolfowitz to shut up and, and wait his term and work through channels and, not, and go through Rumsfeld instead of just putting his hand up and say, how about Iraq? And I go, oh, well, maybe Bush is smart after all. I was right. He had common sense. He wasn't going to get talked into it. Somewhere between November and December, <laughs> Of 2001, he got talked into it. I don't know how they got him, a freedom agenda, grand purpose. I don't know what it was. They got him into the idea that even though there was no evidence, really, the Prague meeting was always shot down, of any connection, that we were going after a country and knocking it down. Obviously, it's the worst set of dominoes have gone down. These Baathists were pains in the butt, but they weren't really dangerous to Israel. They were sitting there as clownish. Gaddafi was clownish. Saddam was clownish. When all those Baathist regimes went down, uh, they were replaced by horrendous. And we were told the same thing about Syria. And they always said the same thing, the experts. Whatever we have with this guy, Assad, and as bad as he is, and he's a killer, a mass killer, what comes next will be worse. They were right. So I made a big mistake voting for a guy who, uh, who made a big mistake. And I think, you know, I think he knows it. I think W knows yeah, I think you're right. that he was talked into by Cheney. Well, by the way, his, his father knows. Pronounced Cheney. Certainly his father knows. And uh, Cheney is a yeah. strange customer. Yeah. I dealt with him on the Hill yeah. uh, when he was in leadership, and all the press fell for him. They thought, oh, he wears button-down shirts, and his wife is literary, so he's one of us. Mm -hmm. He's a moderate. No, mm -hmm. he is not a moderate. Yeah. He is a frightening, uh, militant hawk. And, uh, he, and he has the same attitude towards the Democrats he has towards yeah. anybody in the world. He's, he's, he was frightening to deal with. I would... Uh, I mean, but I was wrong. Not, the answer not... to the question, thank you for reminding me, you ripped up the old scab again. <laughs> Yeah. And, I, and I, I've said this on the air many times. Anybody uh, tweeting right now, it's old news. The, uh, your point on Cheney, uh, not to go to shameless self-promotion of the book, I, I dedicated this book to, to Dick Cheney. <laughs> I did. It's dedicated to Vice President Cheney and to my father who didn't particularly care for him. Um, and uh, I, I would go to these meetings. Look, you may have voted for... Uh, have you ever cast President a vote you Bush. regret? Yes, the Iraq vote. So, so you may have to reconcile your vote no, you got two. George Bush. You I got two. What's the other one? This Iran, Iranian deal. No, well, all right. That's history. History will will decide upon that. But uh, I, um, the actually, only I'm vote kidding. I ever actually, I'm kidding. That's a close the, call. The, the the only vote that I ever cast uh, that uh, I I desperately would want back uh, was was that vote. And and look, I go to the White House again. It's all in this book. I go to the White House and and I was the most junior member of Congress. I'd just been elected. And the way this works when you go to the White House, as Chris knows, is you have this long mahogany table, and all the seating is done based on seniority. So the President of the United States sits in the center, and then a cabinet official, and then they start filling in with members of Congress. Well, because I was the most junior member of Congress, it, it was like you know, Thanksgiving at the Israel House. I was all the way at the end again. I was like at the kids' table, you know, all the way at the end. But that gave me a vantage point, and I would watch. This is fascinating to me. This is where I began to think about this book. The vice president didn't sit next to the president. Vice President Cheney sat directly across from the president. And as the president was making the case for us to invade Iraq, when he would say something, I would watch as Vice President Cheney would on occasion go like this. I'm not kidding you, go like this. He would interrupt the president at, at times. 
He was controlling the meeting, controlling the debate. I remember they, would, they, they, they passed around this piece of aluminum, and they said to members of Congress in trying to justify a vote for Iraq, uh, this is an aluminum component of a nuclear centrifuge in, uh, in Iraq. And you know, I thought it looked like something that fell off my central air conditioner yeah. in, in Dix Hills. And then they passed around this vial of pink liquid, and they said, this is a precursor to a biological attack on our water systems. And to me, it looked like something you could go, you could buy at Rite Aid for an upset stomach. I know. Uh, and so the intelligence was botched. They made persuasive cases. Many of us voted for it based on that intelligence. But the entire thing was driven by the vice president right and now. not the president. Well, you know how he did it. He had, he, he had Scooter Libby, his chief of staff, leak it to Judy Miller of the Times yes. on a Thursday. It runs on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. He manages to get uh, invited to meet the press. And then he's picking, he says, well, as we now know, Tim, yes. as we now know, yeah, Tim, no. It's right. a vuncular, you know, bonding thing he would do. Yes. After he had leaked the thing systematically through Scooter and Judy to put it into the mainstream so he could actually say, you know, we learned in the papers today. Mm -hmm. As if he's just responding to events. It was mm -hmm. so, it was the alley-oop play, I call it like in basketball. Mm -hmm. You put the ball up near the net and the guy stuffs right. it. And right. uh, it was awful. And he got away with it. And I made a mistake, and you did too. Well, mistakes happen. We, uh, I think uh, history will record... Uh, two fundamentally uh, catastrophic decisions. Uh, one was a decision to go to war in Iraq, which I think helped explains uh, what we're seeing uh, today. And then to go to war in Iraq and give a $1.3 trillion tax cut to people, yeah. and then say we can't afford to take care of our veterans when they come home. Uh, and then create a, a budget system where we have to have this thing called sequester because our deficits are so high because we gave a $1.3 trillion tax cut while we were fighting a war that cost trillions of dollars. Those, the convergence of those two things helps explain why we're in the condition we're in. But the good news is that um, we have uh, opportunities to reshape the world. Yes. Every crisis has created uh, opportunities, and I'm very confident that we're going to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. And then Chris Matthews is going to be able to question people like me uh, on those decisions. Well, I want to say it's an honor to come here every time I Thank come you, up Chris. here. And uh, this guy, I'm so glad you've reached your dream. Thank you. To be a U.S. congressman, because it is a great thing to be. And uh, especially to keep your sense of humor and your brains going all the time. Uh, remember, the competition's not that stiff. This remember. book, by the way. <laughs> remember, remember. This book. <laughs> if you like Bilko, <laughs> if you like Kerb, this is really good stuff. It's so funny. Now, I was at the Kentucky Book Festival yesterday signing books we sold out, so please don't let Kentucky beat New York. Okay. Okay. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.